by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggle 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, because the grace of God, unlimited, we are gathered here together, that is Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, to do the 75th study of End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg in the last section of that book, Exploding the Israel Deception. We have come to a new chapter, I think as far as I remember it is chapter 5 that we will start today. I'm very glad that we have still some people watching and um, commenting on these videos and even more glad I am that I have Tom to support me in this wonderful work because he already read this book some years ago, I think about 10 to 11 years now in 2022 ago he read the book already and that set me up to do that for myself and then I just had the fame, fabulous idea to ask him to join me and ever since we started reading Steve Wahlberg's End Time Deception and now uh, exploding the Israel Deception, which is the fourth and latest uh, last section of that book. We turned therefore for the book Exploding the Israel Deception itself instead of reading from the other book, because I think this is a little bit better written. Um, some things in this book are not the same as in, exploding, uh, as in uh, End Time Deceptions. And that's why Tom and I are here together to gather to do the 75th reading. And I want to welcome Tom very much to the broadcast today. Hello, Tom. Hello, Yerk, and hello to the listeners. It's my blessing, privilege, and pleasure to be here and to continue reading and discussing this marvelous book. And uh, like you, I very much appreciate the participation of the listeners and the comments they make, uh, those who are at least amenable to the discussion. Uh, and uh, <laughs> not so much to the trolls, but everyone has their trolls, don't they? But uh, the realization is undeniable. 
that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Jesus, and there is no future fulfillment. And because there is no future fulfillment, at least not according to God, there is no future fulfillment, then uh, this phony futurist fulfillment that we've all been taught all of our lives in the churches is a lie. A lie which says the Antichrist, the future Antichrist, will fulfill that 70th week of Daniel. So, who do you think that's going to be? Well, this phony futurist 70th week of Daniel, if it's fulfilled by the Antichrist, it'll be a false antichrist, a, a counterfeit antichrist, not even, I believe it was last week, I even said that if Mickey Mouse himself, in the flesh, big ears and all, signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and authorizing them to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again, and then three and a half years later, that same Mickey Mouse, big ears and all, reneges on that covenant, that so-called covenant, that treaty with Israel, and causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, then you won't be able to convince anybody in this world that that's not the Antichrist. And Tom Fress will be on every channel saying that is not the Antichrist. Who comes after him will be the Antichrist. And who is that going to be? The papacy. The papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast, the false prophet. And uh, he's deceived the whole world. And all the kings of the earth serve him and have for centuries and centuries and centuries. And together, the Antichrist papacy and the kings of the earth have persecuted the saints of the Most High, have worn out the saints of the Most High, have killed the saints of the Most High, and all of their belongings went to the Roman Catholic Church. That's why it's so filthy wealthy. And together, the kings of the earth and the papacy form what is called in the Bible the beast. And uh, we've seen it being fulfilled all throughout the entire Christian era. So where goes where goes your belief in a future Antichrist? Right down the toilet where it belongs. All you need is a working knowledge of true biblical scripture and prophecy and a working knowledge of true history. And once you receive that, which you're getting in this book, then no one will be able to deceive you again. That's why we're reading this book, so that you get a proper understanding of Scripture and Bible prophecy and history so that no one will ever be able to deceive you again. That's the whole purpose why we're here. This is the 75th lesson in this book. Every one of them are just as valuable as the others. And I highly recommend that you download these programs, put them on a disc, put them in your library, make copies, send them to friends, family, and even foe. And spread this information because the whole world has been deceived. The whole world has been deceived, even the very elect. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, we spoke yesterday in our study with Robert about the point that um, without the um, last week, this one week that is mentioned here in verse 27, without this um, false understanding that is taught all over the world of this one week, um, nobody would understand the seven-year tribulation that is put out in the Jesuit futurist agenda. Um, but the problem is very often that people do not even know where they take these seven years from. That's right. And that's why it is so important that we study uh, Daniel chapter 9, these four verses between verse 24 and verse 27. And I think it is interesting, Tom, that you elaborate a little bit more on that as you did yesterday when you said 
well, this is something that I have to repeat on the program tomorrow because um, many people speak of a seven-year tribulation, but they have no idea where the seven-year comes from. That means that they don't even know that it is all linked to Daniel. Everybody speaks about the book of Revelation, but they don't understand that the book of Daniel is a mirror of the book of Revelation in many parts. It's a precursor of the book of Revelation in many parts. The book of Daniel, especially chapter 9, but also chapter 2 and chapter 7, goes hand in hand with the book of Revelation. And you cannot understand without the other. And that is why we put so much emphasis on the subject. And this is why, Tom, I think you should take a few moments or whatever time you need, and if it's a whole broadcast, it's a whole broadcast, I don't care, to make sure to the people that they understand that the deception of the seven-year tribulation is based on the not told unfulfillment of Daniel 70th week, because in, the most, in most churches, they don't speak about a re-fulfillment or a fulfillment of Daniel 70 weeks, they just speak of a seven-year tribulation. And when you ask the pastors, I think many pastors can't even tell you where they take that from. And many others know, okay, it is taken from the book of Daniel, it's the 70s week that is put apart, set aside, uh, where Jesus Christ made a completely different statement in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, when Peter came up to him and asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sinned against me? Seven times. And Jesus replied, no, not seven times, but I say unto you, 70 times seven. And this is about what I'm reading here. You see, this is the, the divine divorce. This is the next chapter in the book, Exploding the Israel Deception, which we are going to start today. And it starts with this quote. And of course, I know Tom and I, we have been not only elaborating on this verse in Matthew 18, uh, or these two verses, we even have made whole videos about it, but I think it is of the utmost importance for the understanding of everybody, and there are always some new viewers to these videos to really understand not only Matthew 18, 21, 25, where Jesus in his own words absolutely confirms that he is the fulfillment of the 70 weeks prophecy and of the 70th week itself. Because it says in, uh, let me just get Daniel up here again, it says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And what does Jesus Christ say here? You have to forgive them not seven times, but 70 times. It's these 70 times. Well, you know, I'm not a native English speaker, and every time when I do broadcasts with Tom, I see how short I fall to express my thoughts. That's why I love to give the microphone to Tom in this regard, and I hope that he will elaborate even a little bit more, and for you a little bit better of understanding than I have to uh, get to you to the message where these seven years come from and how important it is that we understand that Jesus Christ in his own words gave the understanding to Peter when he asked him that he is the fulfilling of the 70th week. And when Jesus Christ fulfilled the whole prophecy 2000 years ago, what is there to be finished today, Tom? That's right. First of all, there's an order of business that we must take care of, and we must do it often. We must define two terms, the two most important terms in this entire discussion. Those terms are futurism and historicism. Futurism is the school of Bible prophecy interpretation which says that the 70th week of Daniel is detached from the 69th week and cast clear to the end of time and is fulfilled at the end of time, not by Messiah the Prince, but by the Antichrist. Futurism is what is taught in all the churches. It began, began, to be taught in the Protestant and Evangelical churches at the turn of the century in 1805 or 1810, okay? So for nearly 200 years, over 200 years, 
futurism has been taught in all the churches. But that's not what was taught in the churches prior to 1805 or 1810. What was taught in the churches was the other term that we must define, historicism. Okay? Historicism is the school of Bible prophecy interpretation which says the 70th week of Daniel was, was not detached even one nanosecond away from the 69th week. That the calendar, God doesn't play magic tricks with the calendar. Okay? One day follows the other. One year follows the other. One week of years follows the other. And that when the 69th week of, of Daniel ended, the 70th week of Daniel commenced. And it was fulfilled by Jesus the Messiah, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, according to Daniel's prophecy. Not one nanosecond of separation between the 69th, the end of the 69th, and the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? No hocus pocus with time. God is not a deceiver. God does not play tricks upon the saints. Okay? And that 70th week, that seven-year period of time, began with the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he was baptized by John and he was witnessed by the Holy Spirit and a voice from heaven in the River Jordan. Okay? Open testimony. Jesus' ministry as Messiah the Prince began that day. Three and a half years later, after presenting the covenant of his sacrificial blood to the Jews and to Jerusalem, he performed or confirmed that covenant by actually giving up his blood on the cross of Calvary. And when he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, the scripture plainly tells us that the, there was a, a tremendous earthquake, the rocks were rent, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And if you know anything about uh, the sacrificial law, Temple Mount worship, with that veil hanging wide open, anybody who entered the temple would be consumed. Okay, no one was to peer upon the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the Holy of Holies. That veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. And with that veil ripped in twain from top to bottom, that curtain would had to have fallen completely wide open, which would have made the temple for anyone other than the great high priest. And only then, after making sacrifice for himself and purifying himself in a ritual way before he entered the temple, he would have been consumed. Okay, so the temple was a death trap at that point. At least as far as the Jews were concerned. But what it really meant was, heaven is open now. There's no fear. The sin issue has been dealt with permanently. No more need for animal sacrifices. No more bloodshedding on Temple Mount. No more sacrifices or oblations. And, John, and Daniel even perform, uh, uh, predicted it. He will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And he did. Forever. No more sacrifices. And now that we know anybody who makes a sacrifice has rejected the sacrifice, the blood offering that Christ made with his own blood. It is an unmistakable sign of the synagogue of Satan when they make sacrifices and oblations. It is an abject denial of the sacrifice that Jesus made, Messiah the Prince made, the Prince that shall come made 2,000 years ago. Now, from the midst of that week, in the midst of the week when he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, three and a half years later, Stephen witnessed to the Jews and to Jerusalem, remember the prophecy is about the Jews and Jerusalem, he made one last testimony 
to the covenant that Jesus offered the Jews and Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus said, don't go to the way of the Gentiles. Don't go in the way of the Gentiles. The gospel comes first to the Jew and then to the Greek. So nobody was allowed to preach the gospel, the covenant in Jesus' blood, to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, to the Romans, to the Japanese, to anybody else, until that 70th and final week was over. Otherwise, they would have made Daniel a false prophet, wouldn't they? They would have sullied Jesus' prophetic name. Okay? So they obeyed the law, and they kept the gospel to the Jews and to Jerusalem until the end of that 70th week. And Stephen gave the last chance witness of the truth of the covenant in Christ's blood to the Jews, the Sanhedrin, one last time. And they rejected Stephen's testimony, and they stoned him to death to shut him up. That's how you reject the blood and the covenant of Christ in his blood. They stoned Stephen, the prophet, just like they stoned and, and killed in every way possible all the prophets throughout history that tried to save the Jews and the, uh, the Israelites. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that killeth the prophets. That's what Jesus said of them. Gen venerate generation of vipers that slay the prophets. And they even slew their own Messiah. So the gospel had been preached to the Jews and to Jerusalem. They categorically rejected it. Then the 70th week of Daniel ended, and then it was okay to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles have been the possessors and the pro progenitors of the gospel ever since. No Jew preaches the gospel. They reject the gospel. They want to build a temple. They want to begin animal sacrifices again because they reject the Lamb of God. So the 70th week of Daniel is over just exactly the way Daniel prophesied it. All of it. Every jot and every tittle of Daniel's prophecy is perfectly and completely fulfilled by Messiah the Prince, the Prince that so come, Jesus Christ the Messiah. So what what, what would we do? What do we do now with this future belief that we have? Well we have to understand that it's a lie. And most lies are taught for a purpose, and that purpose is to deceive God's people. Now, when they did not know and understand Daniel's prophecy, the Jews knew not the time of their visitation by Messiah. Scripture plainly says so. They knew not the time of their Messiah because they didn't read and they didn't understand and they didn't care about Daniel's prophecy. And it's that same prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, that is so universally misunderstood today that is going to cause God's people today to receive a false Messiah. That's the only thing you can hope for in a future seven-year period of time, a future Antichrist. A false Christ. And the whole world is prepared to receive him because they already believe his lies. It's taught from every pulpit in every church in this country, one form or another. Everybody talks about the seven years of great tribulation. Let me tell you something. There's going to be tribulation. The Bible plainly says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's the same as tribulation. And there's a low, whole lot of tribulation coming for God's people if they all in unison begin to believe in historicism. And then 
what we what we understand is since there's no future antichrist to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel and it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2000 years ago then we have to rethink who the antichrist is and what we find is the papacy is was and always will be the antichrist he has ruled and reigned over the saints and over the kings of this earth throughout the entire christian era we've all been deceived we are all deceived thoroughly deceived hopelessly deceived unless we begin to believe and teach and preach the truth which is historicism there's no future seven-year period of time of tribulation. Oh, trust me, there's going to be tribulation like you could never even imagine, especially if God's people all over the world all of a sudden put futurism in file 13 and return to biblical Christianity, historicist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, and put Jesus on the throne, his the messiahship. And stop believing these cockamamie lies, these abominable lies that we believe, and return to the truth and denounce the papacy as the antichrist that he is and warn the rest of the world that he, through this future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, intends to put himself on the throne of the world. He's the man of sin. Do you want to be a party of that deception? Then you must repent of futurism. You must return to biblical Christianity, historicism, the historicist school of Bible prophecy interpretation. You must then come to the, un the unmistakable realization that the papacy has always been the Antichrist. The papacy always will be the Antichrist even until Christ returns and destroys him with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Okay? And when that becomes to be the orthodox teaching in the Protestant and evangelical churches, you better believe there's going to be tribulation because the papacy controls the governments of the world. And they, just like they've been throughout history, will be directed to kill the heretics. And history will repeat itself. The book of Fox's Book of Martyrs will be just the introduction to the tribulation of the saints. But let me tell you flat out, when that tribulation begins, it won't be seven years. It'll be until Christ returns. The papacy rules this world, lock, stock, and barrel. And the only thing that stands between him and, and uh, the truth is the Protestants and evangelicals who believe his futurist lies. But when they return to the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy, and they see who the real Antichrist is in this world, and begin to speak, uh, speak and preach and teach against him, and put pressure on the kings of the earth to serve Christ and not the Antichrist, all hell is going to break loose. And that's when we'll see the power of our Messiah. But we have to repent of our evil ways. We have to repent of our false teaching. We have to repent of futurism and return to historicism. <laughs> Again, the first job of every discussion is to define the terms. Futurism is the felonious belief that the 70th week of Daniel is not yet fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in the future by the Antichrist. That is a lie. <laughs> Never mind that it's taught in all the churches by all the best Protestant and evangelical pastors that our age can muster. It's a lie, a damnable lie. And historicist is the true belief, the historical belief that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, every jot and every tittle of it, 
and the Antichrist was revealed shortly thereafter in the papacy. There is no future seven-year tribulation. Oh, yes, there'll be tribulation, but it won't be limited to seven years. It'll be limited to whatever God puts limits on. And the papacy would have it that if he had to kill every man, woman, and child on this planet, that's what he would do. If he is not elevated to supreme, global, deified status as the God of this world, he will use every, every weapon in his arsenal to destroy every man, woman, and child on this planet and leave absolutely nothing for Christ to return for. You understand what I just said? If, if the papacy is denied his futurist reality, he will, he will use every weapon at his disposal to destroy this creation from its very foundation and leave nothing for Christ to return for. That's my belief. And uh, it's up to us. It's up to us how this is going to end. I'll tell you how I'm going to, how, how I want, it's going to end for me. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I was thinking about this um, one verse. Um, I think I have to look it up. Um, Jesus Christ even said, in this world, ye will have tribulation. In this world, he was speaking ye to the will saints. have, yeah, tribulation. Yeah. Uh, he said that uh, also to comfort them. So I, I'm just want to, I just want to look up the verse where that is. Um, John 16, 33. So let's just go here to, in the King James Bible, John 16, 33 and have a look at this because this is the time when Jesus speaks about tribulation and let's see if he speaks of any kind of seven years in there I don't think so make it a little bit better these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world and when you are a born-again Christian, Jesus Christ is in you. And when he has overcome the world, you have overcome the world by that too. There's another very important part in the Bible where Jesus Christ says that we live. Um, that we are in this world, but that we should not be of the world. That's a very uh, profound distinction he makes there. Of course we live here. We don't live on Mars or on any planet whatsoever. We live on the Earth. But we should not be of the world. Means we should not be tainted by the quote-unquote happy life they play for us over here. We should not participate in any kind of unrighteousness and the whole world is unrighteous we should not partake of that that's what he meant with that and here he says that we will have tribulation but he doesn't speak of seven years does he Tom does it some say of seven years tribulation never anywhere in the scripture is seven years used as a time limit for anything except the 70th week of Daniel which and Messiah there, fulfilled Yes, and there is no speaking of a tribulation. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's when he went to the cross. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So it doesn't speak of any more seven-year period and surely not of a seven-year tribulation period in Daniel chapter 9 or anywhere else in the Bible. I just think it is, under, it is very um, uh, important that we understand that this, these are Jesus' words. It's, it's, it's in red here. 
Um, that's why, um, you know, in this King James Bible, I think the most uh, the the words of Jesus Christ are in red. Uh, I, I tell you, I tell you, Yerk, what the listeners need to do is when they go to the church, they need to ask their future as pastors, where is it specifically in the Bible where it talks of this seven year period of great tribulation? And keep pressing that pastor until he tells you where it's at. Hmm. Because what he'll tell you is it's the 70th week of Daniel. It's recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. But you know, in your heart of hearts, you know in the spirit, you know in the marrow of your bones, Jesus fulfilled that 2,000 years ago. So your pastor is wrong. Your pastor is clearly wrong demonstrably wrong, ridiculously wrong, deceptively wrong, because what he teaches in this future seven-year period of time that's supposed to be the tribulation of the saints by the Antichrist completely exonerates the real Antichrist, the historical Antichrist, the papacy. And this deception protects the papacy from bearing the brunt of what he really is, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who wears out the saints, deceives the whole world, rules over the kings of the earth, thinks to change God's times and laws, fulfills all the prophecies of Antichrist. This, fu this futurist pipe dream that they believe in exonerates the papacy. Nobody knows today who the Antichrist is. Why, prior to about 1805, everybody that was a Bible-believing Christian knew who the Antichrist was. They preached against him. They prayed against him. They, they, they defended themselves against him. It was the papacy. Books, libraries have been written about the martyrs of Jesus who were killed by the, by the papacy and by the kings of the earth who served him. When you learn the truth about the Antichrist and about the kings of the earth over which he has ruled for nearly 2,000 years, any idea of a future Antichrist becomes disgusting to you. It becomes an abomination to you. And then for the rest of your life, you have to live in sackcloth and ashes, repenting for believing such a ridiculous lie, such a damnable lie. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. I think this was a very important uh, inauguration of today's broadcast. And um, how can that else be when the uh, next chapter, the divine divorce, starts with a wonderful quote where it says in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Jesus always chose his words carefully. His response to Peter contains an important lesson. Seventy times seven equals four hundred ninety which is a perfect reference to the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9. The 70-week period in Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, represented a second opportunity for the chosen nation to demonstrate faithfulness to God. Israel's first temple had been destroyed, and her children carried to Babylon, because she had rejected the warnings God had given by his prophets. Yet through divine love and mercy, another opportunity would be granted her, quote, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, unquote, as we can read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Israel returned to her land and built a second temple. Though she had sinned at least seven times, 
God's forgiveness toward the nation was extended to 70 times 7. Near the close of this period, someone greater than the prophets would come. Then Israel's destiny as a nation would be determined by her response to God's Son. Near the end of Jesus Christ's earthly life, he beheld Jerusalem, and the Bible says here, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Luke chapter 9, verses 41 through 44. When Jesus spoke to Peter about forgiveness being extended until 70 times 7, he knew that the 70-week prophecy was soon to end. He knew the significance of this prophecy to Israel as a nation, to Jerusalem and to the Second Temple. Chapters 21, 22 and 23 of Matthew reveal the sad final and explosive encounters between Jesus Christ and the leaders of his chosen people. It is now time to see the true meaning of those encounters. Therefore, I have prepared and copied the three chapters mentioned here by the book of uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. I copied them into this book and we are going to read Chapter 21, 22 and 23 of Matthew, as it is written in the King James Bible, because we want this to be an extensive study. And when I say we, I mean Tom and me. We really want to look from every possible angle the Bible provides on the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And these chapters, 1, 21, 22 and 23 of Matthew, are imperative for understanding the whole message. That's why Steve Wolberg mentioned them in this book and that's why we are going to read them and study them all three chapters. That's going to take a little while, that's going to keep us a little bit busy, but I think it is of a very important avail that we do so. And in the meantime we do exactly what Tom always advises us to do. Whenever you read in the Bible put the important verses of Daniel chapter 9 next to it, whether in a notebook or on another screen when you're reading uh, on, on the computer, or just take out a pen and a pencil and write them down. Here we will have on the other part of the, uh, of the screen, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, because now we are going to read from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 through 23 with the understanding that Jesus Christ was the one and only perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. But before we start, I have to ask Tom if he has a comment. No, I think you've said it well. And... Uh... Of course, this is a repetition to many of the listeners that have been longtime listeners, but we can't avoid making sure everybody understands this because, look, if the Jews were either denied access to Daniel's 70-week prophecy, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, or whether they were forbidden by the priest to read it, or whether they were deceived by the priest, the significance of it, or the potential fulfillments of it, whatever the case may be, they knew not the time of their visitation. And Daniel's prophecy was to leave absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind precisely when Messiah the Prince would come. Now in our generation, 
that same prophecy is universally misunderstood. We know this to be the case. We've proven it over and over and over again. What will be the consequences for our generation for not knowing the correct understanding of Daniel's 70-week prophecy? I've described it to you over and over and over again, and here it is again. You will receive a false Messiah. In their case, they missed the Messiah. In our case, we will, find, we will uh, accept a false Messiah. Again, missing the true Messiah who will come afterwards. After the whole world has been deceived, after the whole world has worshipped and obeyed the false Christ, the Antichrist, the papacy, then Christ will return. And what will he find us all doing? Will our condemnation be any less? Will our destruction be any less than the Jews who did the same erroneous things 2,000 years ago? I'm here to tell you the stakes could not be higher. The consequences of error in this count could not be higher. It's the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, and it has just as high of consequences. Don't be deceived. Stop listening to the deceivers. Leave them all in an empty house. Abandon the churches. Get your authorized King James Version of the Bible. Read and understand Daniel's prophecy. Memorize it by heart. Read the New Testament for the historical record that it is of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week by Messiah the Prince. And you'll never be deceived again. That's my hope and prayer for everyone that's listening. And we enjoy your comments, your, 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 your input there in the comment section. Let us know. Are you getting it? Is it making sense? You know, the truth, when it's finally heard, has a ring that just cannot be mistaken. You've heard the truth. Are your ears ringing? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, you just made a very interesting point that um, <laughs> gave me the idea to something else, and I just want to propose it to you. Um, we are both reading for the moment a wonderful book that is called Swarms of Locusts, the Jesuit attack on faith, uh, on the faith, which deals, of course, with the deception of futurism. And there is in the back of this book a wonderful sermon from one uh, Anthony Edwards, if I'm not mistaken, is his name. He lived in the 18th century and he read many, uh, or he wrote many wonderful sermons, by the way. And one of the sermons um, that is put into this book is the sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Because Tom just said that we have to repent of futurism. We are all sinners that have to repent of all the lies that we have been swallowing in this world. Like being in the world and being of the world. Because when you're of the world, you swallow the lies of the world with all consequences. You become a sinner. You are not born again. You become a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And here is a choice that you can make, as far as you can make it, of course, because everything in this wonderful book is against uh, is, is the teaching that there's no free will. But that's for another time uh, to go into. Tom, I just want you to consider that maybe next time we are going to read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is a wonderful sermon. It goes about, I don't know, 20 some, 30 some pages in this book and uh, gives the people biblical consequences of what happens when you follow futurism. He doesn't put it in these words, but that's exactly what's going on, isn't it, Tom? Certainly is, but what I wanted to point out in my in my closing comments was 
the the historical consequences that history and the Bible record of the consequences of the Jews not knowing Daniel's prophecy and understanding it. The 70th week of Daniel was misunderstood by the Jews and Jerusalem. And look what happened to them. The temple was destroyed, not one stone remaining upon the other. There was a trench dug all the way around the city. No one could go in or out. They, they, they cut off the water supply. They cut off the food supply. All the women and children died. Starvation destroyed the entire city. No one was left alive in that city. Isn't the Antichrist doing the same thing with the temple of God today when we are the temple? Doesn't What he cut, off, cut us off of water and supplies? Doesn't he cut us off of our spiritual breath that we need, the true I, Bible? I just want to ask the question to the listeners. If you fully understand what happened in 70 AD, and you also understand and agree that it was the consequences resulting from not knowing Daniel's prophecy, not knowing the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Look at the consequences that took place in Jerusalem and against the Jews in 70 AD. And then ask yourself, because we are deceived about the same prophecy, what could possibly be the consequences in our generation? Stop and think about it. I'm not a fear monger. I'm a realist. Just as 70 AD was real history, we're faced with the same kind of real history. No conspiracy theories here. This is going to happen. If God's people do not repent of futurism, if they do not repent and return to a historicist understanding of Daniel's prophecy, then the consequences will be unspeakable. And we'll pray about what God would have us do for the next broadcast. And if he, if we feel led to read that sermon, then we will do so. And uh, don't miss it. Whatever we do, don't miss it. I'll see you next week. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders in their idea about one generational responsibility, one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages. For the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue. To move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about.
third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. <laughs> 